the Fifth Crusade, orchestrated by Pope Innocent III and launched under Pope Honorius III, represented a bold endeavor to reclaim Jerusalem by diverting its focus to Egypt, deemed the economic backbone of the Muslim Ayyubid dynasty. European crusaders, including forces from Hungary, Germany, and Flanders, set their sights on the strategic prize of Egypt, capturing the key port city of Damietta in a move that signaled early success. Yet the campaign ultimately stumbled, marred by leadership disputes and strategic missteps, notably failing to secure Cairo. Hello everyone and welcome to the channel. If you're new here, it's good to meet you. And if you're coming back, it's good to have you with me again. If you'd like to support the channel, links to the Patreon are in the description. Otherwise, like, comment and subscribe and let's get started. On today's topic, which is of course part of a broader series on the Crusades. And if you're interested in that, well, go and have a look in the playlist. Medieval History. I'm sure you'll find them. Now, without further ado, let's get on to the video. By the year 1212, Pope Innocent III's reign had been marked by significant events and challenges, including the disillusionment following the Fourth Crusade's failure to capture Jerusalem, and the Albigensian Crusade's initiation against the Cathars in southern France since 1209. Not just these two, but the rather unusual occurrence of the Children's Crusade. Well, his efforts to recover the Holy Land were further complicated by the establishment of the Latin Empire of Constantinople, with Emperor Baldwin I at its helm, chosen with substantial influence from the Venetians. The appointment of the Venetian Thomas Morosini as the first Latin Patriarch of Constantinople sparked quite a conflict with Innocent III, who deemed the election uncanonical. Now the politics of Europe at this time were tumultuous, to say the least. In Germany, the assassination of Philip of Swabia in June 1208, ended his contest for the throne against Otto of Brunswick, who later became Holy Roman Emperor, and eventually clashed with Innocent III, which led to his excommunication. And it wasn't just Germany. France was deeply embroiled in the Albigensian Crusade, and engaged in conflict with England under King John, known as John Lackland. Meanwhile, Sicily was under the rule of young Ken King Henry the Second, and Spain was preoccupied with its reconquista against the Almohads, leaving very little enthusiasm or energy for a new crusade. In the Levant, John of Brienne became a key figure in the Kingdom of Jerusalem through his marriage to Maria of Montferrat, and upon the birth of their daughter Isabella II, he was appointed regent. The region faced its own challenges, notably the war of the Antiochian succession following the death of Beaumont III, which would not be resolved until 1219. Despite the lack of a truce renewal with the Ayyubids under Sultan al-Adil, John of Brienne secured a new agreement in 1211 to last until 1217 and sought papal support, recognizing the limited military resources in the Syrian Franks. In the April of 1213, amidst a chaotic period for the Christian kingdoms, Pope Innocent launched a clarion call for a new crusade through his papal bull, Kia Maior, 
aiming to galvanize Christendom towards the recovery of Jerusalem. This initiative was further reinforced by the Ad Liberandum Decree, issued during the Fourth Lateran Council of 1215, setting forth a framework for crusading that would endure for nearly a century. The Crusades' promotion, of course, faced obstacles, notably in France, where Robert of Courson's fervent recruitment efforts clashed with the local clergy, leading to tensions with Philip II of France. Despite these challenges, the Fourth Lateran Council sought to address grievances and unify Christian forces, though, ultimately, few Frenchmen joined the initial 1217 expedition. Innocent's vision for the crusade emphasized papal leadership to avoid the misdirection experienced during the Fourth Crusade, which was a complete disaster. He planned for a rendezvous for crusaders in Brindisi and Messina, with strict measures to cut off trade with Muslims to secure supplies for the crusade. The Pope also offered indulgences not only to participants, but to those who financially supported the endeavor. An indulgence is effectively a ticket to heaven, if you didn't know. Now, the Crusade's preparation included ensuring the safe return of Raoul of Merencor, the Latin Patriarch of Jerusalem, with John of Brienne tasked with his protection. Diplomatic efforts were made to reconcile regional conflicts involving Leo I of Armenia and Hugh I of Cyprus to secure a unified front upon the arrival of the crusading force. But Pope Innocent wasn't around for too long. Perhaps that's for the best. Because he died in July of 1216, and Honorius III ascended to the papacy, under whom the crusade of course continued to be a focal point. The subsequent year marked the crowning and tragic fate of Peter II of Courtenay as the Latin Emperor, whose capture and death highlighted this perilous journey to the East. Spiritual leadership and recruitment for the Crusade saw figures like Robert of Corson and Jacques de Vitry playing pivotal roles, the latter facing the challenge of preaching in the corruption-rife Latin settlements of Syria. Oliver of Paderborn's successful preaching in Germany, alongside Honorius's appeal to rulers like Andrew II of Hungary and Frederick II of Germany, underscored the widespread call to arms across all of Christendom. The cultural influence of troubadours like Elias Cairel Fons de Capdoulet, and Amory de Pegulan played a significant part in rallying support for the crusade, demonstrating an intertwined nature of martial and cultural mobilization for the greater good. So, as the armies assembled, estimates suggested a force exceeding 32,000 prepared with advanced siege technologies such as counterweight trebuchets, signaling a formidable campaign poised to make its mark on the Holy Land. This mobilization reflected not only the ambition and spiritual fervor driving the crusade, but also the complex politics and social dynamics that shaped Christendom's response to this call to arms. And so, in the early July of 1217, the Crusaders embarked on their journey to the Holy Land, choosing the familiar sea route. Their voyage commenced from Dartmouth, England, 
where they elected leaders and established laws for their expedition. Led by William I of Holland, the fleet set sail southward, stopping at the renowned pilgrimage site of Santiago de Compostela, before facing storms that unfortunately scattered the ships, delaying their arrival in Lisbon. Now upon reaching Lisbon, finally, albeit a little bit late, the local bishop appealed to the crusaders for assistance in seizing Alcácer do Sal, a city that was under Alamohad control. While the Frisians abstained, citing Pope Innocent's directives from the Fourth Lateran Council, the remainder of the crusaders, persuaded by the Portuguese plea, and in alliance with the Knights Templar and Hospitaller, laid siege to the city. And they captured it in October of 1217. A fraction of Frisians, choosing not to participate in this siege, instead conducted raids along the Iberian coast, targeting Faro, Rota, Cadiz, and Ibiza amassing considerable plunder. They then ventured along the southern French coast, wintering in Civit Vecchia, Italy, before resuming their journey to Acre in 1218. Meanwhile, in the north, King Ingi II of Norway took up the cross in 1216, but he didn't last long. He passed away in the following spring, resulting in a pretty minimal contribution to the crusade from the Scandinavians. Maybe they'll join them next time. Now the Kingdom of Georgia, under Queen Tamar's ambitious leadership, had reached the pinnacle of its power, and was a formidable challenger to Ayurved dominance in eastern Anatolia. Tamar's reign concluded with her death in 1213, and her son, George IV of Georgia, initiated preparations for a crusade to aid the Franks in the Holy Land. However, the impending Mongol invasion in 1220 kind of put a spanner in the works. Priorities had to be prioritized. Georgia's demise led to his sister, Rusidan of Georgia, to inform the Pope that Georgia could unfortunately not honor its commitment to the crusade, due to the Mongols coming to burn and kill everything. I'm sure the Pope understood. Now following Saladin's death in 1193, Sorry to go back a little bit, but we must explain that after his death, his brother Al-Adil ascended the print to the principal rule of Egypt, marking the beginning of the Ayyubid dynasty's leadership in the region. Saladin's lineage continued through his son, as Zahir Ghazi, who maintained control over Aleppo. The early years of Valadil's reign were challenged by natural disasters, including a devastating famine triggered by an exceptionally low Nile and catastrophic earthquakes exacerbating the populations suffering across Egypt and extending all the way to Syria and Armenia. Well, let me explain the Nile situation. Now, the Nile is subject to yearly floods, this is what irrigates a lot of the crops. If the flood is good, everybody's happy. If the flood is bad, as in not enough water, well, everyone gets a little bit hungry. You want to have a good flood, not too good. Don't want to have the house flooding, but just enough to irrigate the fields. Now, Al-Adil's tenure was characterized by a strategic approach to maintaining peace, 
He didn't want any more crusades. They were done with that. He wanted to avoid them altogether. Therefore, he engaged in trade with maritime powers Venice and Pisa, aiming to deter their involvement in crusading efforts against his rule. To strengthen the region's defences, he commissioned the construction of a new fortress at Mount Tabor, enhancing the protection of key cities such as Jerusalem and Damascus. Conflicts during his reign were predominantly localized in Syria, involving skirmishes with the Knights Hospitaller and disputes with Beaumont IV of Antioch, and these were mainly managed through his nephew al zahir Ghazi, although Al-Adil himself did confront the Crusaders directly in 1207, showing that he was willing to negotiate peace through strategic concessions. Now the death of al-Zahir in 1216 introduced a period of potential vulnerability for the Ayyubid domain, as he was succeeded by his three-year-old son, al-Aziz Muhammad, and no one's scared of a three-year-old. The transition coincided with Saladin's eldest son, al-Afdal, attempting to reclaim Aleppo with support from Kakyas I, the Seljuk Sultan of Rum. So that's more farther up towards the north. Now the resulting conflict within the Ayyubid territory underscored the dynasty's internal and external challenges. However, the resolution came when Al-Ashraf, another of Al-Adil's sons, defeated the invading Seljuk forces, thereby preserving the Ayyubid control over the Levant, at least for now. Now back to the European side of things. King Andrew II of Hungary was the inaugural European monarch to commit to the Fifth Crusade in 1217, following Pope Honorius III's summons to honour a vow made by his predecessor. Venturing from Zagreb with a formidable contingent, including notables like Leopold VI of Austria and Otto I, Duke of Merania, Andrew's substantial forces, which numbered at an estimated 20,000 cavalry and a much larger infantry force, embarked from Split to the Holy Land via the Venetian fleet demonstrating the significant mobilization for this crusade. Upon reaching Arca, strategic discussions commenced, led by Andrew II alongside key figures such as John of Brienne and the military order masters. Despite ambitious plans to strike in both Syria and Egypt, Logistical constraints necessitated a shift in focus towards more manageable military engagements. Al-Adil, aware of the impending crusader force, prepared defensively, ensuring his territories in Egypt and Syria were well guarded, particularly focusing on protecting Damascus and Jerusalem from potential crusader advances. The crusaders' initial maneuvers towards Damascus showcased the Ayyubid strategic withdrawals and defensive tactics, avoiding direct confrontation with the crusader force, significantly stronger crusader force. Now back to King Andrew. His leadership in these early stages although not leading significantly to territorial gains, laid foundational strategies for the crusade. His subsequent return to Hungary in 1218, owing to health concerns and the looming threat of excommunication, marked the end of what is now referred to as the Hungarian Crusade of 1217. 
efforts to fortify key crusader strongholds like Chateau Pellerin and Caesarea underscore the ongoing preparations for a larger offensive. Notably, the focus on Egypt as the primary target, specifically the port city of Damietta. The Crusaders made its strategic arrival at Damietta's port on the 27th of May, 1218, marking the beginning of an ambitious siege against Egypt's formidable defences. Initially led by Simon III of Saarbrück, and soon joined by luminaries such as John of Brienne and Leopold VI of Austria. The Crusaders' morale was buoyed by celestial signs, such as a lunar eclipse, interpreted as an omen of impending victory. Now, of course, things like this are really open to interpretation. Contrary to the Crusaders' determination, the Muslim defenders, under the stewardship of Sultan al-Adil, were caught completely off guard. Their complacency rooted in underestimating the Crusaders' resolve. Al-Adil, preferring diplomacy over conflict, found his peaceful inclinations rather at odds with the more belligerent elements within his realm. So, as the Crusaders assembled, reinforcements from Syria bolstered the Egyptian ranks stationed at al Adiliya, though their primary role was defensive, aimed at thwarting any attempts by the Crusaders to cross the Nile. So what about Damietta? Well, it was known for its formidable fortifications. It featured a tri-layered wall system. That's right, three walls, numerous towers, and the strategically vital Burj al Silsila, or the Chain Tower, which controlled river access with massive iron chains. The initial Crusader assaults on this tower were met with failure. Despite the deployment of innovative siege tactics, and even the construction of special siege vessels specifically designed to overcome the city's unique defences. A breakthrough did eventually come, with the leadership and creativity of Oliver of Padibon, whose siege engine, protected from Greek fire and equipped with a novel revolving ladder, enabled the Crusaders to finally capture the chain tower on the 25th of August, a victory that dramatically shifted the siege's momentum. The unexpected loss of the tower, and the subsequent death of Sultan al-Adil, marked a turning point. The succession of al-Kamil to the Sultanate brought renewed efforts to defend Egypt, including the strategic scuttling of the ships to block the Nile. Complicating the Crusaders' position as they prepared to endure the winter of 1218-19 and continue their push against the Ayyubid dynasty's heartland. As the siege of Damietta dragged on and on, the Crusaders found themselves at quite a crossroads. Despite their strategic advantages, the momentum of their campaign began to wane as leaders considered their vows already fulfilled and many contemplated returning home. The logistical challenges of the Nile and the anticipation of reinforcements prompted a approach of wait and see. Among the awaited were Pelagius Galvani and Robert of Corson, dispatched by the Pope with crusaders from Rome, alongside a contingent from England 
led by notable figures like Ranulf de Blondeville and Oliver and Richard, King John's sons. The Crusader camp suddenly faced assaults from Egyptian forces starting on the 9th of October 1218, but they managed to repel the attacks thanks to timely counteractions by John of Brienne and a good amount of strategic failures on the Egyptian side. Despite Pelagius assuming command with a claim to supreme leadership, his initiatives yielded not very much. Further hampered by natural calamities like a devastating storm that inflicted heavy losses on the Crusaders, including the loss of a vital floating fortress, and subsequent disease outbreaks which claimed many lives. Notably, it also claimed the life of Robert of Corson. In the midst of these challenges, Al Kamil's reign was nearly upended by a coup, sparking a chaotic retreat by the Egyptians that presented the Crusaders with an unexpected opportunity to advance. So as the negotiations began, Al Kamil's generous offer to surrender Jerusalem for a Crusader withdrawal from Egypt was met with some mixed reactions. Torn between the secular leader's pragmatism and Pelagius and the religious order's resistance, emphasizing the deep divisions within the crusading camps. Personally, I think it's a pretty good deal. But I wasn't there. Now, Al Muazzam's strategic decision to dismantle fortifications in the Holy Land was a calculated move to weaken potential crusader positions. Despite ongoing assaults by Muslim reinforcements, the crusaders' resolve was stiffened by new arrivals and supplies, allowing for continued, though often futile, assaults on Damietta. Pelagius's aggressive tactics in July and August of 1219 marked a repeated but unsuccessful assaults on Damietta and a disastrous attempt to capture Al-Kamil's camp at Fariskur. Definitely dwindling fortunes for the Crusaders. Yet the Sultan's renewed peace offer, once again stretching out the hand, more desperate and conciliatory than before, was again rejected. Well, that just shows that Pelagius was there for the long run. He wanted Egypt, and he was going to get it, no matter what. Then, Francis of Assisi's arrival at the Crusader camp in September 1219 marked another poignant chapter in the narrative of the Fifth Crusade. Initially barred by Pelagius from pursuing what seemed to be a doomed mission, Francis, along with Illumato d'Arieti, was eventually permitted to cross enemy lines under the assumption that they would simply never return and stop being a problem to everybody. However, contrary to expectations, Sultan al Kamil was intrigued by these Christian mendicants and entertained their message, a bold denouncement of Islam with unexpected tolerance. Although calls for their execution arose, I mean it was blasphemy, and the Muslims generally don't like that, al Kamil himself allowed them a respectful hearing and ensured their safe return, a gesture that underscored a mutual pursuit of peace and respect amid the conflict. Now Francis's interactions with Al Kamil transcend mere diplomatic parley. They manifested his lifelong dedication 
to the ethos of Christian missionary work, exemplified by his previous attempt to convert the caliph and his legendary encounter with the wolf of Gubbio. This episode did not culminate in the sultan's conversion, as later Franciscan narratives suggest, but it did ensure a gentler treatment of Christian captives, and marked a significant, albeit symbolic, bridging of the two faiths. Now, back to the siege of Damietta, stretching all the way from 1218 to 1219. That represented the Crusaders' relentless efforts to recapture the Holy Land. Despite initial setbacks and the grueling campaign marked by environmental hardships and internal strife, the spirits of the Crusaders were buoyed by a failed resupply attempt by al Kamil's forces. This misstep had the unwittingly unified the Crusaders, propelling them towards the city's eventual capture. Damietta, found nearly deserted and laden with the spoils of war, offered the Crusaders a strategic and extremely high morale boost, a victory on all fronts, albeit at staggering cost to the city's inhabitants. But, you know. Now post-victory, Damietta became a focal point of contention among the Crusaders, caught between the secular and ecclesiastical claims to its rule. John of Brienne's departure, under unclear circumstances, left Pelagius completely in charge, a decision later ratified by Pope Honorius III, further entrenching the papal authority in the Crusades' leadership. The succession crisis in the Armenian kingdom of Cilicia following Leo I's death significantly impacted John of Brienne, a prominent figure of the crusade. And despite Leo I's designation of his infant daughter, Isabella of Armenia, as his heir, Pope Honorius's initial support for John, through his marriage to Stephanie of Armenia, underscores quite an intertwining of politics, inheritance, and the crusade as a whole. John's claim was abruptly terminated by the deaths of Stephanie and their son, leading to a swift papal shift in support of Raymond Ropin, Leo I's disinherited relative. Well, John wasn't giving up yet. His journey to assert the claim, followed by his strategic withdrawal amidst the controversy, and subsequent relinquishing of his claims illustrates a transient alliance and the shifting sands of power of the time. His departure for Jerusalem, rumored as desertion, but aimed at securing his inheritance and his eventual return to the crusade, reflect the dual pressures of feudal obligations and the crusader ideal. The unguarded sea routes, leading to a Muslim attack on Limassol, exemplify the logistical challenges faced by the Crusaders and the constant threat posed by the Ayyubids, even after the significant victory at Damietta. The departure of the Cypriot forces, alongside John's return journey through Cyprus, potentially replenishing his ranks, demonstrates the importance of naval strength in maintaining control and supply lines across the extremely important eastern Mediterranean. John of Brienne's actions, oscillating between personal territorial claims in Cilicia and his commitment to the crusading cause in Egypt, embody 
the role of the crusader leaders who had to navigate personal ambitions, feudal loyalties, and their obligations to the Pope. Now, with that being said, the period of following the capture of Damietta by the crusaders in the 5th century was not marked by celebration, but rather stagnation and internal discord, ultimately setting the stage for the catastrophic Battle of Mansurah in 1221. Despite achieving a significant victory, the crusader forces found themselves mired in inactivity, undetermined by a lack of discipline and strategic direction. Pelagius's stringent rules, while intended to maintain order, failed to effectively mobilize the crusaders or protect vital supply routes from Cyprus, leading to significant losses and contributing to a sense of disillusionment with the ranks. At this point, everybody had pretty much had enough. The addition of new troops, including contingents led by high-ranking ecclesiastical figures, such as the Archbishop of Milan, did very little to galvanize the Crusader forces. Meanwhile, the Muslim world, under the leadership of Al-Kamil, adapted to the new threat posed by the Crusaders, reinforcing strategic locations such as Mansurah and renewing diplomatic overtures for peace, which were consistently rebuffed by Pelagius and the Crusader leadership. The Crusades' fixation on prophecies and rumors of the mythical Christian King Prester John coming to their aid illustrates a desperate hope for divine and miraculous intervention in their campaign. This belief in prophetic victory clouded their strategic judgment, leading to rash military decisions such as the ill-fated advance on Cairo, the anticipation of support from Frederick II, which was delayed and ultimately ineffective, further exacerbated the crusade's precarious position. In contrast, the Muslim response, characterized by diplomatic efforts and military reinforcements, demonstrated a more pragmatic approach to the threat posed by the crusaders. The Ayyubid's ability to shift focus and resources in response to changing circumstances, including the potential threat from the Mongols, underscored their resilience and strategic acumen. Which leads us to the 4th of July, 1221. The crusade, led by Pelagius, made a pivotal yet ultimately ill-fated decision to advance towards Cairo. Against the counsel of more experienced leaders like John Brienne, who was advising very sternly against this decision. But of course, no one listened. This bold move aimed to press their advantage following the capture of Damietta, but quickly faltered due to a combination of overconfidence, inadequate preparations, and a complete lack of understanding of the local geography and enemy tactics. The Crusaders' camp, poorly situated and poorly constructed, proved to be vulnerable to the Ayyubid Sultan Al-Kamil's strategic responses. Al-Kamil, leveraging his intimate knowledge of the region and his newly arrived reinforcements from Syria, skillfully maneuvered his forces to isolate the Crusaders from Damietta, their critical supply line. Despite warnings from his allies and the dire visible build-up of Egyptian forces, Pelagius persisted with the offensive. All of this led to a dire situation for the Crusaders. 
the Egyptians capitalized on their geographical advantage by utilizing the Nile's canals to outmaneuver and besiege the Crusader forces, effectively cutting them off. In a desperate bid to retreat, the Crusaders found themselves completely trapped, compounded by their own negligence in safeguarding their wine stores, leading to disorder within their ranks. Now recognizing their precarious position and the futility of further combat, especially after the Egyptians flooded their encampment by opening the Nile sluices, Pelagius decided it was probably time to initiate some peace agreements. But this time, the terms weren't so forgiving. The Crusaders were to relinquish Damietto and agree to an eight-year truce in exchange for safe passage home, the liberation of prisoners, and the return of the True Cross relic, which was probably the one that stung the most. The negotiation process was naturally tense, with the exchange of hostages to ensure compliance. Notably, the Crusaders' hostages included John of Brienne and Herman of Salza, while the Egyptians offered up al Kamil's son, as Sali Ayub. So, the surrender of Damietta on the 8th of September 1221 marked a humiliating conclusion to the Fifth Crusade, with the Crusader forces retreating under the terms agreed upon. This retreat underscored the campaign's complete strategic misjudgments and logistical overreach, ending the Crusade without achieving its lofty objective of reclaiming Jerusalem. And actually, they didn't achieve anything at all. They only lost more, and they had to hand over the True Cross. Thus, the Fifth Crusade concluded with no significant gains. It was marked by substantial losses in lives, resources, and, of course, reputation. The premature initiation of offensive operations before Emperor Frederick II's reinforcements arrived, and the rejection of a peace treaty, were sources of widespread bitterness. Key figures faced personal consequences. Walter of Peleria was exiled, and Admiral Henry of Malta was initially imprisoned, but later pardoned by Frederick II. John of Brienne? He faced criticism for his leadership, and was notably absent during the critical phases of the crusade in 1220. What about Pelagius, though? Well, he was denounced for ineffective leadership and his refusal of the Sultan's peace offers. Frederick II received the harshest criticism for his apparent lack of commitment to the Holy Land, focusing instead on European ambitions. Additionally, the Crusaders failed to secure the return of a piece of the True Cross, a significant religious symbol, which just added to the campaign's perceived failures. Just throw it on the pile, I suppose. Well, thank you very much for listening. And that was it, the Fifth Crusade. Was it different to what you were expecting? Interesting one. What a mess. I'd like to thank my patrons. That is, Stark Factory, Jeffrey, and JC for their contribution. If you'd like to make your own contribution on Patreon, you know what to do. Look at the comments in the description. But, I hope you've enjoyed the video, and I will see you in the next one, which will, surprise, surprise, be about the Sixth Crusade. Good night, everyone. I'll see you next time.